Um, okay, well, hello everyone. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Hace. It's actually our third birthday tomorrow, so we've been going for th- I know, <laughs> we're going been going for three years. Um, whoever knew that we would survive even a week into the pandemic? Um, but have survived um, the pandemic. My colleague Beth Burrows is here, who is head of data as well. So thanks, Beth, for joining. And I'm sure she could interject if I forget anything about the data because it is her job. So um, yeah, so I a little bit of background on me is I have worked with child labour in global supply chains for over 10 years. Um, it's about 12 years now. So worked from um, in a variety of different sectors, Um, I started working back in 2010 with state-imposed child labour in the cotton industry in Uzbekistan, and I worked with human trafficking and trafficking of children in the fishing industry in West Africa in 2011 and 12, and then I worked in Bangladesh with um, in the ready-made garment sector and child labour in the ready-made garment sector, which is very much associated to the fashion industry, and I think that um, The way that we think about child labour, certainly from a UK perspective, is if I ask anyone about child labour, they usually associate it with South Asian countries in the fashion industry. And that is, I think, a direct result from what I saw of the Rana Plaza factory collapse that happened, um, where thousands of women and children died um, in in Bangladesh. And I think the way that we still think about it is, is there. And... Actually, I'll probably debunk a few myths around child labour that actually that's not where the majority is at all. Um, So I think that child labour is a very, it's a very, very, very niche part um, of human rights. Not that it should be, but that's the way that we think about it. It's a very niche part. And I think that it's a lot of the reasons why we still have so many children in child labour is partly because of those misconceptions and partly because if we don't, if we have those misconceptions, then we actually don't know where we should be looking for child labour, which means we can't reduce that child labour. The main motivations, I think, for starting HACE and, and, um, again, keeping at it for three years is the the fact that we still don't, even we don't, um, have a scalable solution to child labour. So the way that child labour has always been approached is from a very small um, perspective so in a qualitative way um, in a small community or in a commodity um, etc and then those findings are extrapolated out and applied into a different context and child labor doesn't work like that it's it's way more complex than that and I think that the last thing and I will probably mention it a little bit about our methodology I don't go too much into it is the fact that um, child labor is often oversimplified so we kind of think about what is causing child labour or the root causes of child labour. And it's spoken about all the time in company reports from the UN is poverty equals child labour. And that is a really dangerous oversimplification um, because poverty is relative and it means lots of different things to lots of different people. Um, So what poverty might be in rural Ghana is not the same as what it is in rural Bangladesh or rural UK or rural US, et cetera. So this kind of very like large statement of poverty equals child labour means that, oh, well, if we reduce poverty, then child labour will decrease with it. And actually we see the data that sometimes shows the opposite. Um, so I think poverty as a word in itself is quite, um, needs to be unpicked a little bit more. Um, so there's a kind of uh, very, very short background on me um, and using data um, was to enable the scalable solution and a more standardized solution towards child labor. So I guess why I said it's a bit of a niche part. Um, If anyone could write in the chat, how many children they think are in child labor globally? How many children globally? Yeah, thousands. Yeah. Bass, don't answer, please, because obviously, you know. um, (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, some some really decent responses coming in here. Um, And again, it's not a test as there's kind of no right or wrong, but it's actually 
160 million children in child labour, which is roughly one in 10 children globally. Um, and these were 2020 estimates, and we've done a fair bit of work to prove that it's actually lots more than 160 million, but we, we keep going with them. Um, we have to kind of go alongside the UN here. So 160 million children aged five to 17, a fair few million, um, tens of millions actually below the age of five as well. Um, globally. The issue with child labour is that it's actually increased by 8 million children over the past four years. So it went from 152 to 160. Um, so it's a growing problem rather than something that is decreasing in supply chains and globally. And I think that children work in a variety of different conditions um, in hundreds of different commodities, um, 142 raw commodities, 76 countries. It's actually, again, the stats are a lot higher in every single country and there's lots of you know um there's loads of child labor in the uk for example there's lots of child labor in the us so even high income countries have um real big issues with child labor so 79 million of those children work in hazardous work i won't go too much into the definitions but um do reach out if you want to know anything else about child labor as a problem and i think that um so 70 percent of child labor is in agriculture um not in industry, that's actually the smallest percentage. Um, about eleven and a half percent of children are in industry; the rest are in services. So, if you've got seventy percent of one hundred and sixty million in agriculture, agriculture in global supply chains is usually the bottom of, right at the bottom of the supply chain. So, if we have tier one of a supply chain, which is assembly lines, like in a factory, in a garment factory, it's where things are sewn together and then shipped. That is a but if we trace it all the way back to tier eight in a cotton field, that's where you'll find the child labor. And when I say find child labor, if you walk into a field, if any of us walked into a field, you'd see it. But for corporates, they don't have that visibility into tier eight in the supply chain. And there's lots of different legislation that's pushing forward saying, are companies responsible for tier eight of the supply chain? Are they responsible for these lower tiers? We can argue back and forth. Yes, they are. And it's increasing that they actually are liable for these kind of um, in this, these kind of tiers in the supply chain. But the issue is, is they don't have visibility into it. So they can not only not trace it, but they can't see into it. So what happens is child labor comes out in the media and we've all seen it where child labor occurs in X country, X supply chain, X company. And companies say, well, we didn't know it was there. And sometimes they really didn't know it was there because they don't have the level of visibility because they say it's not our responsibility. However, that is changing. Um, and what we see as well is that there's a huge financial risk attached to child labour and in an environmental, social and governance agenda or sustainability agenda for a, for a company, child labour is possibly one of the worst reputational things that could come out. There's no, yeah, but with child labour it's like no you should not be profiting off the back of exploiting children and children's work so we see a little bit more of a movement um with with corporates moving a little bit a little bit quicker but compared to 2010 they move a lot quicker than than they are moving a lot quicker now than they did then so um this visibility is everything that we work with so we we work with visibility into those bottom tiers of the supply chain and we do that from a data-driven perspective. Um, the I will talk a little bit about the issues with the data, but our methodology around data or what we um, fundamentally extract from a data perspective is data on how people live. So visibility into a supply chain or transparency in a supply chain is different to traceability of the supply chain. So knowing where that supplier is is different to being able to see how that supplier lives. And all of the root causes of child labour, where it happens, why it happens, what I can do about it is in how people live. It's in communities. 74% of children are family workers. It's within a family. Um, so if we can't open up that visibility, then we'll never be able to do anything about child labour, which is why we think that it's on the increase. But there's also lots of other theories around it. So the way that we approach um, data and I guess our solution is I'll talk through these a little bit more um, but it all kind of hinges around these things here which we call community data sets and those data sets are big um, big data sets on how people live um, from a variety of different 
different perspectives. Um, we cover 10 sectors, so we go from education to transport to internet and internet and technology, all the way through to energy and fuel, electricity um, and water and sanitation, loads of health, lots of kind of different things. Um, and we standardise that across geographical contexts. So if we, we collect or extract exactly the same data as we would in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh as we would in Nigeria, as we would in Tanzania, et cetera. So the data becomes not standardised, but what we're extracting is standardised. Um, so we can have the same visibility and then compare the drivers of child labour within that. Um, so these are, I will talk a little bit, is where all the data's hoarded. Um, it's, where, it's where it all is. Um, and then we have built um, an AI tool that extracts that data from an automation um, in an automated way. Um, and they feed into, well, to all of our products, really. But our main product that we sell for corporate, sorry, um, for corporates is this, this product here called Aslam. And everything that we do in Aslam is it's an end-to-end -end solution for corporates. Um, but what it covers is policy and compliance. It covers their data systems. But most importantly, we look at the root causes of child labour, what is happening in that country, what is happening in that geographical context. And we make recommendations of how corporates can actually tackle that problem. If they choose to tackle it, great. And we monitor that impact. If they don't, then that's also not necessarily our responsibility because it's not our dollars to spend. Um, later on in the year, we'll be moving into an image-based auditing um, app and platform, which we'll talk about a little bit later. These are designed, yes, yeah, for our corporate clients to open up the supply chain visibility, be able to see the child labour and what they can do about it. And um, on the 6th of March, which is super exciting, um, I'm sure Beth's jumping up and down on her seat as it, as it is, we're starting um, our product development of the Child Labour Index, which is... Um, AI powered ESG index to monitor corporate performance on child labor um, from three different perspectives that is fed into financial institutions. And the reason why it's fed into financial institutions is so they can push down on their corporate clients to move quicker back to this product so they can do something about child labor rather than saying, yeah, yeah, in 2025. So it's all about getting child labor on the agenda in the ESG, in the sustainability agenda. So that's our, that's our product suite. Um, talking a little bit more about the data. So we take Bangladesh as an example. Um, sorry, I hope there's not too much background noise. I'm still in the office. I'm an open plan. Um, this is our Bangladesh community data set. So it's made up of about 70,000 rows of data from 170 different data sources. So the way that we approach data extraction is we work a lot with existing data, um, existing data that's usually in tables, in PDFs, from hundreds of different sources, governmental sources, intergovernmental, UN factions, um, NGOs, et cetera. We, um, we identify the data, we extract it, we warehouse it, we make it into time series data sets, um, push it all together, do some nice analytics on um, what's driving child labor in that specific location. Then we triangulate that back with qualitative data to see is the analysis actually true or not. Um, which brings us to kind of questions around ethics of what machines spit out versus, you know, how we triangulate those findings. So this is just like a real snapshot. We don't have self-service to data for corporates because they don't need this kind of level of information, but it just shows um, how the how the data sets work. Um, so more than happy to kind of take some questions on the data on the data at the end or like how we approach it. Um, but just some just some key data challenges, I think. Um, we often get asked, why is it you that can, why is it your tiny company that's based in Manchester that seems to hold all of this IP when it comes to data? Like, can't Google just pick up this data and just do what you can do? Sure, if Google had the interest, I'm sure that they could build a table extraction tool and look at lots of warehousing of data sources, but it's really, really, really tough. Um, so I think that, I'll talk about how the data teams are, are kind of how we've structured data teams um, to show that actually Google probably couldn't do the process in the way that we do. But it's taken us three years to get to this point. So now it's um, now we feel like we're pretty confident. So this is an example of a piece of data that we would extract. This actually, Beth, if I'm not wrong, looks like a JPEG file rather than an actual table extraction. But so you often get 
you know, printed or you screenshotted tables in PDF. So you go, great, can't write a Python script to extract that. Excellent. Um, so a social scientist um, will identify this data as useful for us to be extracting. So this is about road density. Um, transport access is what we would call this. But we it looks nice. So we go, oh, brilliant. OK, excellent. And then we look at, no, the data sources exclude raw roads. OK, fine. Then we look at the sources at the bottom. So we chase raw data like no one else. So we say, OK, well, if these are the raw data, we've got World Bank, Bangladesh, some sort of survey in 91, another survey in 2001, another one in 2000. Which, which years is it from? Is it, is it for the different countries? Like, where's this data from? Did they aggregate the numbers together? Did they not, et cetera? So I think that there's a lot of issues with quality assurance around the data. So we would look at this and say, no, we can't, we can't trust, in inverted commas, these numbers because we don't know where they're from. And if I go on this, you know, so someone will look into Bangladesh Transport Sector Review 91, and if they don't see those numbers and they chase all of this data and there's nothing there, you can end up chasing your tail round and round. We can't just extract data like this. And I think that um, this is this is really common across everything that we do, um, not just from a standardization, but how data is being collected. So, you know, wherever this was printed and wherever this is printed from whichever report it comes from, whoever's printed this hasn't thought about this data ever being used. So they don't think, oh, maybe I should be more specific about where this specific data point came from. They just go, well, I'll just print this because no one will ever use it anyway. And they're right. No one ever does use it because it's unusable. Um, and again, we go round and round. So this is why we work with existing data that exists already in PDF reports, because if we don't know where the gaps are and we don't know where the data issues are, we will still collect data like this for 25 years and we'll still be in the same situation in 2025 and 2030. Reporting on data that isn't that doesn't make any sense. Um, so if we think about child labor specifically, mm -hmm. we would look at this and say a percentage distribution of some population 10 years by activity and division. So this is the activity, which is work, types of work that people are doing. And these people are 10 plus years. So seven of those years could be defined as child laborers. But we don't know who 10 plus years is. We just know that it could be 10 to 64. It could be all adults. It could, we've got no idea. And also it's not labeled as child labor. So it's difficult to be able to extract it. You've got to have someone that knows that this 10 plus years actually could refer to child labor or might not. So this is a type of data source that we would use for something like triangulation of findings rather than the data itself, um, because we can't be sure, can't be sure that this is, this is child labor or not, because it doesn't say 10 to 17. Um, so again, this is just uh, another we could uh, <laughs> kick it on forever and ever about this is just one. These are just three examples from one country. You know, like it's it's never ending. So um, I think that we highlighted that we highlighted this for for specific reasons. So the way that our data teams are structured is the ident identification extraction processes of the data is all done by social scientists. So um, people not necessarily trained in a quantitative background, not computer scientists, um, not data scientists. And there are very specific reasons, as you can start seeing, of why that is. And that is because a social scientist has to make um, decisions about the way that the data has been collected and what those logical assumptions are that they have been trained to detect. So I think that like we talk about this all the time about being inclusive in tech and data and creating jobs for people that aren't necessarily from a technical background. Um, and this is a perfect way that we've been able to do this um, by creating data teams and data extraction teams. Yeah. And it feeds into all of our products. And, it, you know, there's no kind of hierarchy of like data scientists has all the say on the analytics. Like whatever they say is true because actually they didn't extract the data and don't know necessarily where it came from. Um, so it's all we have like interdisciplinary teams and like multidisciplinary teams where we can't we can't like sell analytics without it being triangulated by social scientists who extracted. Do so you think that the way that we approach data teams is um, not like I've ever seen before in companies? Because people look at me like I'm crazy. 
like how are you letting people you know and I'm like you're crazy um so these are best people best people for the job like this is what we're trained for and um this is just an example where this is um internet technology and in it's internet technology so a technology might not be the internet so this is an example of a 2000 where the internet was not an accessible thing then so it could have been another form of technology like a telephone or a tv or a radio or etc so you know thinking about what those subject matter experts are trained in and how they can identify data i think is a, a different way of approaching data extraction um I appreciate I only have 10 minutes left, so I will speed up. Um, this is another example. So I think these are just warnings of like when you're working with that kind of social data, all the, all the problems that could come up with it. Um, so this is um, three, three different reports reporting on literacy rates in uh, Bangladesh from three different surveys. Two are from the same year, um, different sample sizes, of course, same sample units. Um, and we can see quite a large difference between the two just from a glance. And uh, we can say, well, okay, this is a logical increase, so 55 to 65, but then we've got all 79 in the same year. Because like, oh, maybe it's sample size, that's the difference. And once we start digging in a little bit further, once we look at the age range of how that data is being collected, we've got all above seven years, above five, and 11 to 29. So these data points are relating to different age groups. So how do we aggregate or how do we identify which is the which is the truest data point do we go on sample size um do we not go on sample size do we look at methodology etc so when we look further into the methodology just as another one here men we can actually see that the way that the data is measured so we work a lot on data measurement and how data is measured back to the existing data and why it's so important to explore the existing data is the, the organisations that are collecting this data actually define literacy in a different way. And we see this across multiple UN. Like in UN, the same kind of UN factions or different parts of the UN are also collecting literacy rates in different ways. You think there'd be a standardised definition. This is what literacy is, and it isn't. Um, and it's not in countries or geographical locations. So write a letter in any language, writing a simple letter. It's like, what's simple? What does that actually mean? simple sentences four basic rules or which you, you know it's it's it can become quite um difficult quite quickly so these are just some of the some of the issues that we see within the data there's loads of success stories as well but you know these are just some of the issues so um how we used to extract data is we used to do it manually into you saw a kind of very um rough data model here so we created a, a really standardized data model and data schema that we use across all geographical locations where I collect metadata in with um, with raw data. And because of the way that we structure the data teams, um, we knew that we needed any automation that we had around data extraction had to be inclusive of people who don't code um, and don't want to code and that we had to have inclusive tech. So we partnered with the University of Salford and we created a data extraction tool. Uh, which is absolutely amazing and um, our data extraction tool has enabled us to about to automate about 80 percent of data extraction and table extraction um, with human supervision of course so just um, thought I'd do a little very kind of simple um, tool that we built but it's enabled us to speed up processes so much um, quicker and also our algorithm can change so if we ever did change a data model or change per country we can change a lot in um, from from an algorithm in a very 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 easy way from a no code um, perspective so this is Beth doing a little demo of this um, so now we can extract data metadata just from dumping and dropping from hundreds of different data sources and um, yeah, so that's the way that we've approached data, data extraction. Um, so going on to kind of what we um, what we do from once we've got the data is this is an example of um, what was actually distributed to lots of auditors um, or hundreds of auditors in rural Bangladesh and one of our biggest clients. Um, and this covers about 45,000 communities in rural Bangladesh. So this is all pulled from our data sets and all triangulated by quality, with qualitative data. And this 
shows what is driving child labour within those communities. So if I'm an auditor and I want to find child labour, I should probably be looking at these types of families and these types of communities rather than trying to find the child labourer that every time they know that the audit is coming, they won't be there. Um, and that's why child labour is notoriously difficult to find from an auditing perspective. But if we know, if we tip it upside down and we know what's driving the behaviour, it means that we can maybe predict where it will be um, and be able to um, see who which children are more vulnerable than others. So this is a, um, a nice visual that, that we did um, that's close to the one that's being in use in, in Bangladesh. So you can see lots of our 10 sectors coming through um, here. Um, just a note on the on the kind of types of data. Um, Beth, my colleague, works a lot on innovative data sources. So we've got table extraction. So we use a lot of quantitative data that's already existing, but we're moving into satellite data as well. Um, so we work very closely with the University of Manchester and we have a PhD student there that um, looks at um, geospatial and spatial analysis and satellite data to predict child labor prevalence. So now a lot of our data can be extracted from satellite or we can um, use satellite data for electricity coverage and road coverage versus using kind of older data that might not be as accurate. So we're trying to merge or merge mediums of data together to understand visibility a little bit more. Um, we also work with the University of Manchester, but University of Salford as well, um, through different projects of mapping commodities and looking at child labour and prevalence of commodities with machine learning. So, um, yeah, that's what we do in our Athlon product. So we're very exciting. We don't have any nice visuals of this yet um, because it's starting development on the 6th of March. So I'll just go to the highest level possible. So um, our child labour index, which is designed to score companies on their performance, um, when I say performance, it's how they are, in the first instance, associated with child labour from a public perception perspective. So which, which companies are associated with child labour from media and social media, um, and they're scored on that. So we're um, pulling, um, mining lots of data from LinkedIn, Twitter, and all in the archives of all the traditional news. And we then look at how they perform from a disclosure perspective so what do they actually disclose themselves companies some companies refer to child labor in their policies or they refer to it in their esg reports and usually these are the companies that are investing more in child labor if companies don't talk about it it usually means they're doing nothing about it because companies if they're spending money love to talk about it from a sustainability perspective um which is our usually number one tip top you know tip top tip um, is which company should I buy from? Well, it's difficult, none of them really, but if they're talking about it a little bit more, it's usually better, or they're investing a lot of money into it, then usually better. So what are they saying? What is the quality of that disclosure? Um, what does their supplier code of conduct say? What does their modern slavery act? What does their compliance look like? And finally, um, we're looking at building different risk models based on our uh, community data sets and other various bits and pieces like trade data, known child labour cases um, and pulling together risk of exposure. So it's the risk of exposure of child labour in the supply chain. That can be from a commodity or geographical perspective or both. Um, and then this gets aggregated into a score out of 100 and red, amber, green status, and it gets fed into financial institutions so they can see how the companies they own, which they usually own most companies, are performing um, from child labour perspective. And later on in the year, um, very, I know I have a couple of minutes left. We're moving into uh, building a image-based auditing tool. And this is to remove the bias and issues that we have with auditing. And I could talk about this for a very, very long time, just auditing itself or social auditing. So when an internal auditor or an accredit accreditation company like Fairtrade or internal audit, so companies, pay auditors to go internally to check on their supply chain or self-assessment. So lots of suppliers have to assess themselves when it comes to, to auditing. Do you have child labor? Yes or no. The supplier is going to say no because they don't want a company to cut their relationship with them. So what is happening is companies are paying an awful lot of money to audit, but they know that the data that they get is rubbish. Like they know that they can't rely on it anyway because auditing has got lots and lots and lots of different problems. Um, usually slow, untimely data, lots of bias, um, et cetera. 
So we're moving into um, image-based auditing, which is app-based. Um, lots of it is based on object detection and object classification. So an auditor goes in with an app, um, downloaded, takes a picture of something, machine classifies what it is and what quality it is. This is an example of a water source. So auditor goes in, takes a picture of water source. Machine is trained to know what it is and what the quality of it is. Um, it's then uploaded into cloud, but it's also user ID'd and, and with a geolocation, even offline, which means that we can also trace the supply chain all the way back down to tier eight if we want to, um, as well as seeing what's happening in the supply chain. Goes to cloud, machine is trained again, we know machine learning, and then it gets fed through to a client dashboard so they can see where the data points are being collected and what's actually happening. From an ethics perspective, we don't give our clients or we would never give clients access to actual images um, because it's not up for them to actually see exactly what's going on um, but you know selected samples etc and in the back end we can you know if auditors are overriding the machine we can see why and we can manually verify that etc um, and then the machine gets trained again and more data points we've got coming in you know bigger training data set more accurate so we can it starts to open up the supply chain visibility and that auditing data that comes in is more trustworthy as far as we can you know is moving towards more objectivity rather than expecting that something will always be objective so that is what we're moving to in the end of the year so we've got you know lots of product development starting um we will have lots of product development starting um this year so that's it these are our partners as well so thanks to all of our partners as always um who support us throughout our journey and advisors and, and, and everyone else. And thank you very much for having me.